in response to riots in Bristol against the policing bill, which would criminalize disruptive protest, Nigel Farage tweeted the following. In Bristol tonight, we see what the soft-headed approach to the anti-police BLM leads to, the Black Lives Matter leads to. Wake up, everyone. This is not about racial justice. These people want all-out anarchy and street violence. And as you can see there, he's tweeting that with a video of a police van on fire. Now, there are a number of problems with this tweet, as you would expect for a, a Nigel Farage take on any kind of protest. But the ones here are particularly clear, which is, this was not a Black Lives Matter protest. Now, in the videos I've seen, I think everyone I saw rioting was white. I can't say that as a blanket rule, but from the videos I've seen. And no one actually claimed this was a demonstration about racial justice. It was about the policing bill. Now, obviously, those issues intersect, but this wasn't people saying we are here as racial justice activists. So why has Nigel Farage said this? Now, you know, it could seem puzzling at first sight. Has he just misunderstood? Is it the case that he just has not read up um, the demands of the policing bill or he hasn't looked closely enough at the videos of the, uh, of the rioting that took place? It's possible. I think it's more likely this is part of his, I suppose, lifelong endeavor to associate non-white people with violence and racial justice movements with violence. That's exactly what he's doing there. He's, he, you know, he's, he's looking at a, a riot, which from my perspective seems to have been involving overwhelmingly white people. They're not Black Lives Matter. What's the first thing he brings up? Black Lives Matter and racial justice campaigners who he wants us to demonize and assume because they're talking about racial justice actually want to burn down police vans. Now, Ash, this is all very gross. Do you think that we've just sort of chosen, you know, one tweet, the most obnoxious but marginal opinion, which is Nigel Farage, who's now a politician condemned to the past anyway? Or is this sort of association that people draw between any kind of violence, whoever's committing it and for whatever end, with black people and racial justice issues to, to associate them together? What do you make of it? Well, this is actually a tactic which is being... Um, deployed by other sort of, you know, shock jock figures on the far right. Uh, whenever there is um, anything to do with protest, immediately it's BLM, defund the police, you know, Marxist anarchists on the street. And it doesn't matter what the cause is. It could be the Sheffield tree defenders. And that's going to be the narrative that they pull for, because what they're trying to do is import a very Americanized um, law and order culture war, which is explicitly racialized and use the exact same coordinates for framing and understanding UK politics um, over here. So I think we're going to see a lot more of it and it's, it's going to be commonplace. Um, just like McDonald's, Starbucks, Friends, uh, and MTV, the most annoying things which uh, dominate America will eventually find their way over here as well. Um, there's, I think, another uh, aspect to this which is sort of worth bearing in mind, which is that we have an incredibly shallow media culture. And it also, I think, creates um, quite a shallow political understanding as well. So you've got to understand that when people look at images, they're sort of reading them through other images, which they have a grasp on and can kind of understand. So it doesn't matter that all of those people are white, you know, they look like the same, you know, Antifa that, you know, the far right have been distributing videos of, you know, who've mustered in Portland or Washington, D.C. or wherever else it is. So it forms part of a kind of network of images which shape a kind of right wing paranoiac uh, political imagination. And so Nigel Farage appeals to that kind of imagery because he knows that it, it works, it lands. And it's also something which gets sort of, you know, recycled upwards um, and finds its way in the kind of framing which exists in mainstream media. There is a convey about of framing, you know, images, rhetoric, um, which start on the kind of weirder corners of far right internet and then find themselves, you know, in the Times and the BBC, uh, at the Evening Standard and wherever else you care to mention. So obviously this is ignorant, it's untrue and it's misleading, um, but it's not an accident, it's deliberate and I think it will have an effect. Mm, it's important to mention as well, you're talking about this network of images 
it doesn't actually just come from right-wing shock jocks. There was a really important study um, that was in the Huffington Post just about a week ago where they had compared the number of people found guilty of a crime in a six-month period in London um, with the number of people whose convictions were press released by the Metropolitan Police. Of the people who were... So this is this is showing you white people and black people. And in the, the blue column is the share of people who were sentenced. And in the green column is the share of people who were press released their, their sentencing. So you can see here that of people who were sentenced, who were arrested in London, 45% of them were white. But 33% of the people who were press released by the police were white. So you can see there's there's this big disparity and you've got the same thing um, on the other side, obviously. So the share of people who were sentenced who were black in London was 29%. The share of people who were press released saying that there had been a crime and there had been someone who was convicted, 44% of those were black. So you've got this complete disparity. And whether or not that's intentional or otherwise, I mean, that probably is a sign of institutionalized racism, where you're a police force, you choose whether or not to press release different convictions. You don't, you don't press release them all. And you're way more likely to press release them if the person in question is black than if the person in question is white. You're completely right to point that out, is that it's not just um, far right shock jocks. It's also a strategy which is employed, um, whether knowingly or not, by the police. Um, but the point about institutional racism is that it doesn't matter really whether it's you know conscious or not. It has these impacts which contribute to the ongoing criminalization and unfair treatment of black people within our criminal justice system. But you can also see the police playing into a kind of culture wars uh, media framing in terms of how they responded over the last week. So one of the things that's happened, uh, you know, is that the Metropolitan Police put up a guard around the statue of Winston Churchill following the Sarah Everard vigil. Now, the statue of Winston Churchill, I think at one of the BLM uh, demos, had racist graffitied on it. Now, of course, criminal damage is, is a crime, but, you know, it's also a fact in this case. Um, but nobody had any interest in the statue of Winston Churchill following uh, the abduction and killing and arrest that was made in the case of Sarah Everard. And absolutely nobody was bringing Churchill into the conversation after the heavy handed police tactics prompted a kind of nationwide debate about uh, the appropriateness of those kinds of measures. Um, no one was talking about Churchill, but just by having the visual of coppers in their hives surrounding the statue, what it was symbolizing is we are part of this culture war and we are on the side of this, you know, very reactionary, very nationalistic and very paranoiac um, political fantasy of what the battle is and who our opponents are. So the police are taking a very active role in this at the moment. Um, and it's because you've got this kind of unholy triangle of political interests of Cressida Dick, uh, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police and the nation's most senior cop, Priti Patel and Boris Johnson. Each of them is covering the other's right flank. And so I think that you are going to see, I think, a much more active role being played by the police in this cultural framing of what their job is. 